Well, hey, Cascade Church, welcome to another Wednesday's Word. Plowing through Ezekiel and Hebrews, if you're sticking with us, if you're a little bit behind, remember there's grace. You don't get to heaven because you read every verse of the Bible. Sometimes you just got to jump ahead and let your sanity um, recoup a little bit. I've been keeping up, but sometimes I've had to play um, catch up a day or two, so there's no guilt, no shame, no condemnation if you're in Jesus. It's helpful, um, learning so much. As you go through the Bible, what we have to realize is you're not going to get everything the first time through. Sometimes we think that if God is teaching us, then everything should just make sense the very first time. But that's not how we learn anything. None of us learned the alphabet the very first time we saw it. None of us learned our multiplication tables the first time we went through them. We start doing the alphabet when you're a baby. They put letters all over your crib and blankets, and then by the time you're you know, five, six, seven, eight, twelve, whoever it is, you're able to start reading, and the letters just naturally make sense. So in math, you slowly begin to add two plus two, four plus four, and then you move into multiplication, division, cosines, tangents. It gets more complex, and you see more than the numbers, but it takes a long time to get there. So if you're reading the Bible and it's just frustrating and it's going over your head or it's boring or you're not seeing, like, where do they get this, all these ideas, don't kick yourself. This is not how we learn anything in life. Everything takes time. Everything takes meditation and devotion. So rest, enjoy the process, and realize that you're beginning a lifetime of study. I've been doing this since I started studying theology when I was 19. I'm 51 now, and I still am seeing new and new things. Preparing for this coming Sunday sermon in John 17, there were things I'd never noticed before. So don't be discouraged. In Hebrews chapter 10, this is what I really want to focus on today, it begins saying that the law is a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. So you have to understand the context. This was written to a mostly Jewish audience. That's why it's the book to the Hebrews. But it was written by somebody who lived in the first century. So first century Greek-speaking people, and the person who wrote Hebrews, if you read the whole book, understand the type of wording and the type of Greek he's using. He's a very, or he or she is a very intelligent person, very well-versed in the Old Testament and in philosophy. He's using some very academic terms at times. And so I firmly believe that when he uses these words, he's tapping into a bunch of traditions. He's looking at the entire Old Testament, going into Moses and Melchizedek and um, just all those great heroes of the faith, but he's also tapping into Greek philosophy. It doesn't mean that Greek philosophy is, is real, as real as the Old Testament, but it's a type of thinking that people used a lot at that time. It was really shaping the fabric of the Western world. It's shaped how we think. If you've been to college, you've probably had to study a little bit of Aristotle and Plato and Socrates, and it is a formative thing. One of the most famous analogies of Greek philosophy is Plato's cave analogy. So Plato in the Republic talks about Socrates, his mentor. You never know if Socrates actually said this stuff or if Plato was using Socrates as his puppet to put his own thoughts out there. But he's talking about what reality is all about. And the analogy he uses, he says, imagine yourself. You go into the bottom of a deep, deep cave and there you see a bunch of men and women tied in chains and they look at a wall and in front of them on the wall are shadow puppets. Behind them, there's a campfire and people with little stick figures of horses and cows and people. And they throw their voices so all the people tied up only see the shadow puppets. But to them, that's reality. They see these things interacting with each other. They see these things um, explaining life. Their whole world is shaped by these shadow puppets. And so they've never seen a real horse. They've only seen a shadow of a horse. They've never seen a real person. They can't even see themselves. They only see the shadows that they cast on the wall. And this is the analogy he uses. And he says, imagine one person finally gets free from that. They scramble to the surface. And the first thing that happens is they're blinded by the reality. They've never seen light before. So their eyes take a long time of weeping and overcoming until they can finally see. And then they begin to see real trees and real courses and real people. And it's amazing. And so they go back into the cave and they try to liberate their friends and tell them what reality is, that none of this that you're seeing is reality, that true reality is out there. And the people would completely freak out. In Plato's analogy, they kill him thinking he's a madman. And so when the author of the Hebrews says the, shadow is a, the law is a shadow of the good things to come, what you almost picture is the cave analogy. 
What you see in the blood of goats and calves, what you see in Moses, what you see in the Sabbath, even what you see in what angels do, are just shadows. The reality is Christ. And so when you finally see Jesus, there's no reason to keep playing with shadow puppets. When you're finally free and your eyes are acclimated to the gift of grace that you've been given to in Christ, there's no reason to go back to kosher and the new moon festivals and all the things of the Old Testament. You have the reality now. And that's such a great analogy because as you go through everything, when it talks about even Jesus, the, the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, everything in that Old Testament is a shadow. Melchizedek's this weird one where he just shows up you get no lineology from him, you get no background, but Abraham pays him a tithe. He shows up and he's the king of Salem, which is, Salem is Shalom, the prince of peace. So it could be Jesus just showing up early, it could be just another priest who God revealed himself to, we have no background on him, but he's mysterious and powerful. And Jesus is a lot like that, the author says. Melchizedek even is a shadow that says, okay, the shadow looks pretty cool. Just imagine how great Jesus is. And so when you get into how to understand the Old Testament, that's the bridge you have to take it through. Why do we no longer eat kosher? Kosher was a shadow to remind us that we're holy. That's why Jesus purposefully takes kosher away when he lowered the fishing nets to Peter and says, take eat, everything I've made is clean. It was never unclean. We only did kosher laws so that you would see how holy God calls you to be. Back then, they would trim the corners of their beards. Their beards would be square to make sure that they weren't confused with the Gentiles, just look different. There's nothing holy about looking different and having a different hairstyle. It was to remind you the shadow of the reality. The reality is you're a set-apart people. As Peter would write, a chosen priesthood, a holy nation, people belonging to God. Sometimes we forget, and a square beard can be helpful, but we don't need that anymore because we have the reality. We don't need to kill a goat to pay for our sins. The reality is Jesus. The goat never took our sins away. Looking at the reality, they're looking through it to who Jesus would fully be. They never understood, but they had an inkling. They had a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do. And so that's why we have Jesus. Jesus is true and better than everything in the Old Testament. And so as we think about those things in the Old Testament, take it through that grid. We no longer have to keep count, um, separate polyester cloth. We no longer have to worry about eating cheeseburgers. But we do have to live to the holiness God has called us to be. And so a lot of the moral commands of the Old Testament are valid. We still look to men and women, one man, one woman in marriage. We still look to honoring parents. We still look to not murdering, to being people of love. But we don't have to keep kosher because those things were fulfilled in Christ. All right, feel free to send any questions you have. That's all I've got for today. God bless.